what this is all about. I uh, had everything from a baptism to a foot washing, uh, but you'll see what it is. It's, uh, you're gonna, you, nobody's going to get it, so don't hold your breath. So we're, we're in our second in our series on, on the first letter of Peter, and we are, we're going to just continue right through the first chapter. We left off uh, last week in chapter 10, so Peter continues in verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 1, where he left off in verse 9. So let's just read verse 9 and verse 10, which says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So uh, he goes on now to give an explanation about the salvation that was proclaimed by the Old Testament prophets. Now, this is an important explanation of God's plan for redemption as it was revealed through God's spokesman in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel. This is a passage, this, this verse here, that, or these verses we're going to read, this is a, a passage that has been classically used to explain the two stages of the prophetic plan of redemption. It's sometimes referred to as the two mountain peaks of prophecy. Now last week I mentioned that 1 Peter is in many ways a commentary on Isaiah 53, which is the prophecy of the suffering servant who was like a sacrificial lamb on whom the sins of the world had been placed. The passage clearly explains, Isaiah 53 the, in the Old Testament, clearly explains the sacrificial and substitutionary nature of that servant's sufferings. Peter describes in clear and unambiguous language that Jesus was that suffering servant, and he was the fulfillment of all that was described by Isaiah 700 years per earlier. Part of that explanation is seen here in verses 10 through 12. And so here we go on to what we had been reading earlier. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied uh, of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into." Peter refers to the prophets seeking the fulfillment of things which they spoke of as they were being led by the Holy Spirit. The prophets saw two stages of the redemption plan when Peter says that they saw the sufferings of the Christ and the glories that would follow. Now this has been used as an illustration by countless dispensational Bible teachers to help believers understand the nature of the body of Christ as an unrevealed secret. This drawing behind me was first made to show the relationship between God's two stages of the redemption plan. It comes from a book by a man named Clarence Larkin and was, was made in, or written in 1918. We see how the sufferings and the glories of the kingdom are portrayed as two separate mountain peaks that can be seen from the perspective of the Old Testament prophets looking forward towards uh, what, what they were, the, the, the prophecies that we were, they were receiving. And so they saw the sufferings first, the glories that would follow after that. So by describing the suffering of Christ and the glory of his second coming and establishment of the messianic kingdom, we see that there was something in between those two mountain peaks that the prophets could not see and that had been kept secret by God. And that unseen valley is, of course, the dispensation of grace in which we live. It was not mentioned by the Old Testament prophets because they did not know of it. And we are the ones traveling through that valley right now. We can look back and we can see the mountain peak in the, in behind us of the suffering of Christ to pay the penalty for our sin. And we look forward to the final days. 
What is unknown to us is how much longer this valley goes on before we will be taken away and those left behind will need to start the climb up that second final mountain peak, which at the top, of course, will be Christ's millennial kingdom. Notice what more Peter says, though, about the things that the prophets saw. The passage says that they searched for what the prophecies would look like and when they would be fulfilled. The prophets were not exactly sure what was going to take place and when it was going to happen. And it says, um, so, so they, they were searching these things. They could not exactly see them. So though they were writing about very specific descriptions, they could not tell if what they were seeing was going to be fulfilled in their lifetime or if what they were talking about was going to take place yet in the future. So for that reason, the gospel writers, when we look at the gospels uh, that record the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, they needed to point out that those events were in fact the fulfillments of what the Old Testament prophets were writing about. For example, when Herod tried to kill the children in Bethlehem, all two years old and under, Matthew then interprets an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Jeremiah and lets us know that this was the fulfillment. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. Pointing out that the, the slaughter of the innocents by Herod was the fulfillment of what Jeremiah had prophesied in the Old Testament. Likewise, when at the crucifixion the soldiers were ordered to break the legs of the ones on the crosses, and when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they didn't need to break his bones. And to prove that he was dead, rather than breaking his bones, they, they pierced him with a spear. And John then tells us that this too was a fulfilled prophecy. And these things were done that the scripture should be, be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture say, says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. No one would have known that these prophecies were being fulfilled were it not for the specific divinely revealed information that we have here. The same will be true about the future prophecies as well. Peter said that the ancient prophets were intently looking for the fulfillment of those prophecies, but those prophecies were, were not really written for them. It was written for those who would ex have experienced their fulfillment, so that those, would be, those who were alive when these things were fulfilled, or those who witnessed them, or those who come after, would be able to look back and say, of course, that's what he was talking about. The prophets, from their perspective, they wrote these things. They didn't know if these things were going to be fulfilled in their lifetime. They didn't know what exactly some of these things were going to look like. But then, when they were fulfilled, then God gave, uh, gave inspired commentary on it so that they could see and understand this was, in fact, a fulfilled prophecy. And here we see, to them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So this is a principle that can be applied to those prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled as well in the end times. Now hundreds of books have been written about prophecy by teachers trying to explain future events. They will tell you the meaning of each one of the bowls of wrath in the book of Revelation or what all those strange and bizarre creatures represent. The fact is that just like the Old Testament believers could not explain the meaning of the prophecies of the first coming until they were fulfilled, we should not expect to be able to do more than that other than to understand the general scheme of events. But we will probably be able... Uh, but, uh, but that's the extent that we should be able to ex ex expect to be able to identify all of these prophecies that we see. Now, the good news is that we will not need to explain all of these things because we are going to be taken out of the world before those things are fulfilled. And so that's, that's the good news for us. So we can look at them. We can be amazed. We can even, as it says, the Old Testament believers, they, they studied them trying to, to understand them. But ultimately, it wasn't for them, it was for those to whom they were fulfilled, as he says here. 
And so we look at that, we can look at that same principle as we try to understand all of these unusual prophecies that we see in the book of Revelation and in, in other prophetic books. Ex understanding that these were really written for those who are going to experience those things at that time. Now, beginning in verse 13, Peter makes a dramatic shift to discuss the life of those to whom he was writing. He uses an expression, he says, gird up your loins. Now that, that's found elsewhere in the New Testament when he says that. It's referred, it's, it refers to in the day, of course, they, uh, men wore robes, they wore long flowing robes. And so when they were girding up their loins, they would take the bottom of their robe and they would wrap it around their waist so that they could run or they could do physical labor completely un unhindered. And so when Paul is telling them, gird up the loins of your mind, he's using this metaphor, he's using this figure of speech to say, okay, now get ready for business. This is where it's going to get real. Get yourself ready. Because when he uses that term, they understood what it meant. When, when somebody would gird up their loins, they were going to run, they were going to walk, they were going to do some kind of physical labor. So that's what he's telling them to do. Now I mean business. And he says here, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. He tells them here to live as obedient children, not following their way of life before they knew about the saving grace of God. And then he drops a bombshell in verse 15. He says, Just as God is holy, his children are to be holy. Now this is a monumental command to be holy as the Lord himself is holy. Just think about what that means. Be holy as I am holy. Now what exactly does he mean by holiness? The words that are used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, that come from from pagan backgrounds have the connotation of setting something apart for religious purposes. Temples were used for pagan worship. They were set apart to be used for exclusively for that purpose. And that's where this idea originally comes in the, in the pagan background of, of uh, religious worship. However, the Lord God, as he revealed himself to Israel, gave this term a much greater meaning. Holiness is understood to be an attribute of God himself. It was not just taking an object and setting, apart, setting it apart. It was the idea that God himself was apart from creation. He was separate, and he was separate in a moral and an ethical sense. As I said, holiness is an attribute of who God is. In fact, I've heard it said, I've heard it described that holiness is the attribute of God. And all the other characteristics emanate from his holiness. I've read the following quote describing it. Holiness is like the sun's rays combining all the colors of the rainbow into sunlight. That all of these other attributes of God are really summarized in this single attribute of God's holiness. Holiness has the primary connotation of being separate. And so when we are called to be holy as God is solely, we are to live lives as though we are separate from the corruption and the sin of this world. That does not mean that we live in isolation, that we are called to, uh, but rather we are called to engage and to confront the world, but we are still to be separate from its behavior, separate from its values, separate from its priorities upon which the world system is based. We are to separate ourselves from all that the world stands for, all that the world desires, all that the world wants. That's the first connotation of holiness. To be holy as God is holy, however, is not an easy standard to attain. It is accomplished, of course, in a positional sense. When we believe the gospel, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, and one aspect of that baptism is that we are separated from the world and made righteous in God's sight. 
That position cannot be changed. It's the way that God sees us because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been credited to us. The context here, though, is clearly referring to our practical life. It's not talking about our positional holiness. He's, he wouldn't command that. It doesn't need to be commanded. If we've believed and trusted that Christ as our Savior, we have that positional uh, holiness. We have that positional sanctification. He's talking in practical terms. So since we live and still struggle in this life, and because there is still a sinful nature, the remnants of the sinful nature that are within us, which will never be eliminated, is this an expectation that we can even reach to be holy as God is holy? I would say in our day-to-day -day life it is un unachievable. But that's why this doctrine of positional sanctification is so important. Understanding that God will always see us as holy and righteous and justified in his sight means that we don't need to fear failure. Very much like the song that Josh was singing. You know, I, I, can I be good enough? It's already been done. That's why the value of understanding this positional sanctification. God is telling us to be holy as he is holy, but while we're still struggling with sin in this world, it's not going to be accomplished, really. We're always going to have something that's going to be, that's going to be holding us back, keeping us short. But understanding the fact that that we have, have this position in Christ that is unalterable, that cannot be changed, we don't have that need of, to fear failure. We still have the standard of God's righteousness, however, to strive for, but even when we fall short we don't, and don't live up uh, to that, we don't have to worry about losing our position. And that certainly gives us courage to carry on. It's somewhat like a tightrope, tightrope walker who's tied to a safety line. He's walking across a canyon or maybe between two buildings or across the, the um, Niagara Falls. And he might slip and fall, but as long as he has that wire to keep him there, he's going to eventually accomplish that goal. He just doesn't give up. He gets back on the tightrope and he keeps going. And so if we, even though we can never achieve this perfect holiness, and since we are secure in Christ, some might ask themselves, well, why do we even try? Why do we even try to live a, a, a righteous and holy life? Well, the answer is very simple, because we're told to. Be holy as I am holy. It's not something that we have to argue about or even have to try to, to uh, rationalize. We don't have to say, well, God, you know, I can't do it. I still have this sinful nature that's, that's still bugging me. I still have all of these, these issues that I can't overcome. Anyway, I'm already secure in you. I'm already safe. So what's the point? He's saying, that's, don't, don't reason that way. That's just like what Paul says when he says, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't, don't even think that way. That's not the way the Spirit of God is going to be guiding you. Rather, you look at this command and you see that God has set a standard for our righteous behavior and our separation in this world. Be holy as I am holy. It's similar to the command that Paul gives when he says, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which he says is, is our reasonable calling. This is what we are called to do. So the question then is, how do we accomplish this? Is it a matter of just trying to you know, get rid of all the sin that we can just by, by personal effort? So I know you've all been wondering what this is here for. And so this is, uh, now you're going to finally find out. So I, I'm going to take this dry towel and I'm going to put it in the water here. Soak it all up, get it nice and wet. And then I'm going to wring it out all my effort. There's a lot of water in here. Okay. So as tight as I ring this, I'm going to get about 98, 99% of the water out of here. But is this dry yet? No. Nope. nope. No matter how much I ring it, in fact, once I reach a certain point, and I can see I'm dripping all over the place, once I reach a certain point, it actually becomes 
It actually becomes counterproductive because as you tighten it up more and more, <laughs> then of course the air that really is going to complete the job can't even flow through. I could, it will sit here for a week if I leave it like this and just set it there. It's going to sit there soaking wet for a week. It's never going to get dry. And that's really, that's like trying to become holy in our own strength, under our own power. You can get rid of much of your sinful behavior through sheer will willpower. I'm not going to do this any longer. But there will always be that tenacious sin that you're not going to be able, able to overcome no matter how hard you try. Sometimes those are referred to as besetting sins. It's the sins that are unique to our personalities, and they are the hardest ones to overcome. Those are the sins that keep us from enjoying the intimacy of the fellowship that we are entitled to as children of God, because we still have that, that wetness that we are not going to be able to get out just with our own effort. That's what's going to keep us from truly enjoying the intimacy that we should, should have as God's children. So how do we go about then? How do we go about getting closer to that ideal that God has established for us as to be holy as God is holy? I have another illustration. This comes from the world of water softening. Okay, how many of you out there have water softeners? Okay, so, so everybody can, will be able to relate to some extent to what I'm going to tell you about here. So earlier this week, uh, I went on an overnight camp out with, uh, with Miles to Spring Mill State Park. And if you've ever been there, they have two caves that uh, have a, an underground river running through them. And in one of them, they take tours and you go, oh, about a half mile into the cave and you get to see all the stalagmites and the formations and then in the middle they turn the lights off and it's completely dark and you see just how dark it is and if you're lucky you can see one of the fish floating around that doesn't have any eyes which is you know amazing obviously the evolutionists will say they that that evolved I think God had had a better idea he was the one who put them there but regardless of that you you're in under this limestone cave and you get to see what basically everything in Indiana underneath the surface looks like. And that's why everybody in this room has a water softener. Because if you don't, in about a week or so, you're going to start to get stalagmites or stalactites forming from your, from your faucet. And so we all have these, we all, we all have to have uh, water softeners to make the water at least uh, able to, to use in a practical way. So now you need to know, to, to understand, fully understand the illustration here, you need to know a little bit about water chemistry and how water softeners work. So, as you all know, you've got uh, a column in the water softener, and that's filled with a resin that has an affinity for calcium. Calcium, of course, is the mineral, that primar primary mineral that causes hard water. We're also familiar with the salt reservoir, where you go to the store and you buy a 40-pound bag of salt, and every month or so you put three or four of those in there, and, uh, and then they disappear. And you wonder, where did all of that salt go to? So we're all, we all know about the salt reservoir, and the way it works is that resin, as I said, has a greater affinity for the calcium than the sodium. So you... When, when the salt brine flows through the, the, res, or through the column, through the, the resin, then it's saturated with sodium. It's saturated with salt, sodium chloride. And so then as you turn your tap on and water goes through, little by little the calcium goes through, and because that resin is more attracted, or the calcium is more attracted to the resin than the sodium, it replaces the sodium with the calcium. And so that's why what comes out of, the, out of your faucet does not have the hardness because calcium is removed. The sodium, which doesn't cause hardness, doesn't cause the, the bad effects in the soap and all those kinds of things, um, it, it doesn't really matter there. So, so then after a, after a week or two or something like that, then the column with the resin is full of calcium. So in order to be able to use it again, you have to get rid, you have to flush that out, and you have to replace it with more sodium. 
And so the way that works is you use just a huge amount. That's what that brine is for. It's a highly concentrated salt solution that's full of, there's so much sodium in there that it overwhelms the calcium. And basically, even though the resin has a natural tendency to want to keep the calcium because there's so much sodium, eventually it just replaces it completely. Okay, so now you've had your little chemistry lesson. Can't say you didn't le learn something, unless you already knew this. So you can also do the same thing, and sometimes it's if people have uh, salt limitations but, and they drink the water, they do the same thing with potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride, although it's more expensive. And so the potassium can do the same thing. You, you flush it with the high levels of potassium and it replaces the, the um, calcium and so then you have a, uh, have a new fresh column and then as the water flows through the calcium will replace it once again. So for the purposes of this illustration, let's say that the sodium is bad but the potassium is good. Both of them can do the same thing, both of them might have the same effect, but sodium bad, potassium good. So how does this relate to holiness? What does water softeners have to do with holiness? Well, it has nothing to do with it, but hopefully it has a, there's some value in this illustration. So remember, sodium is bad, potassium is good. And then I couldn't write the whole word potassium, so I just used the chemical K, which is what the abbreviation for potassium. So at the start of the cycle, the column is saturated with sodium. That's often, that's much like what unbelievers are as young people. Young people that are completely unbelievers, they might have these besetting sins of youth. It's what Paul says to Timothy when he told him to flee youthful lusts. Things like sexual temptation, selfish ambition, thrill-seeking that might cause them to abuse drugs or engage in Ill illegal activity. And that's kind of what their, the column looks like. It has all of these besetting sins of the lusts of youth. Then we start to get older. And as we age, those things start to fade away. But if we don't have the Spirit of God within us, or in many cases even if we do, but we're not letting the Spirit of God guide us, these besetting sins of youth are replaced with besetting sins of maturity. The things that kind of gather with older, as we get older with old age. It might be things like anger, resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, a critical spirit, inflexibility, a lack of empathy, and the list goes on and on and on. And so they, these are the ones now, these are the sins that start to re replace those sins of the, of the youth. These are the ones now that have a greater affinity. They stick, they stick on harder. Now, to get rid of those besetting sins of maturity, it's going to take a flushing of the concentrated brine to wash them away. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the world who try to get rid of that, that, those besetting sins. They look at their life and they see themselves as an older person. They say, I don't, want, I don't like this. I want to be like I was when I was young. And they never have gained wisdom. And so, amazingly, they go back to their lusts of the youth. And this is, this is really true. I've talked to a number of pastors who live in retirement locations like Florida and uh, Arizona, places like that, places where snowbird, snowbirds like to go to get away from the cold. And they have told me about the terrible problems that, these, that they have to deal with with retirees who go to these places and try to act like kids again. They figure that, well, they're done working, they're done raising their family, the women know that they can't get pregnant, and they're away from the communities that they live in and grow up in, and so whatever happens there, nobody knows and nobody cares. And I, I had one pastor who described it to me, pastoring a, a congregation of more, more or less retirees, he said, I feel like I'm a youth pastor again. <laughs> because I have the same problems, drunkenness and sexual immorality and all these kinds of things that these kids were dealing with. Now I have people at the other end of the, of the spectrum. 
I've read that the population with the highest growth rate of sexually transmitted diseases are those over 65. Obviously, those are, those, who have, those are individuals who have never gained maturity. And what's more is that is certainly not the route that the, devoted, the devout Christian, the devoted Christian should take. Now the way that God would want us to eliminate those besetting sins of maturity is also with a brine, but with the good brine, the brine of his word. The result would be of saturating ourselves in the truth of the scripture, which will ultimately yield the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We need to have a greater concentration of God's word flowing through us. We need to have that, that, that super concentrated um, presence of God's spirit through his word flowing through us so that, that old, the old sins of the calcium of, of the sins of maturity are replaced with the, the word of God, with our, replaced with the, the, uh, the truth and, and the, the fruit of the spirit that comes through exposure to God's word. And this is exactly what Peter says in the rest of the chapter. He points out beautifully how we need both, first of all, to have the gift of eternal life, it begins with the gospel. It begins with the transformation that comes through knowing the gospel and then with the word of God. And as we continue through this chapter, we can look and we can see how he develops that idea. So he gives us the instruction here in verse 15, be holy as I am holy. So how are we to do that? Obviously, he reminds us that it begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. It begins by knowing, believing, trusting that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sin. Verse 17 in this passage, it says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. This is a warning to the unbeliever. Because the believer, for the believer, that judgment has been taken care of. For the unbeliever, however, that judgment will take place when the books are opened at the great white throne judgment and all of their works are laid bare and judged by, by the Father. Here in Revelation chapter 20, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, and great standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book of life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Then Peter goes on in this passage with strikingly beautiful language about how we avoid those just rewards for our dead works. It's by having been redeemed with, not, with incorruptible things. Things not like silver and gold, which are going to perish and pass away, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or spot. And we read this beautiful passage. This is, this is a, a reiteration of the fact that Jesus Christ's death paid the penalty for our sin, but he uses such, such wonderful language here to express it. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The passage then goes on to describe the second stage of developing holiness. It begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ through believing the gospel. The second stage, of course, is through the word of God. He starts with the assumption that his readers have trusted the gospel and having purified your souls. It says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, uh, love one another fervently of a pure heart. So he begins with the assumption that they have had their, their souls purified through faith in the gospel. But then he goes on 
once again with, with, with beautiful language to describe this, talking about how it is God's word that guides us, God's word that helps us through this process of attaining holiness, and how it is unchanging and it lasts forever. And look what he says here. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers fall away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Now the world wants us to believe that it's always got some new and better philosophy by which we are to live our lives. There's always some new intellectual fad that we're supposed to follow along with. In recent decades, it's been, we've been told that we need to interpret everything in the world through the lenses of postmodernism, which states that there is no objective reality, that everything is just a social construct that has been shaped by our cultural experiences. Whatever is true for, true for you is true. Whatever is true for me is me, even if they contradict one another. Of course, those ideas are soon going to be replaced by something else. Peter reminds us, however, that there is universal truth, and that truth is contained in the eternal word of God. And it's only by saturating our souls with that word that we can even begin to approach that standard that God has set for us, which is to be holy as he is holy. And so we look through this, this passage of scripture. There's just so much wonderful truth, and I've only really scratched the surface. There are a lot of verses that I, that I left out here, and I would encourage you to go home and to study this more personally for yourself. But with this, keep in mind the, the command that God has given us, that he is instructing us to be holy as he is holy. And the only way that's going to happen is through saturating ourselves with the truth of God's word. And so we should be doing that on a regular basis. We should be reading his word every day. We should be meditating upon it. We should be thinking about it so that it can take those, take that calcium that's gripping us and it can be pulled away because it's overwhelmed by, by the good word of God, by the good things that, that the word of God has to say. So those things that, that want to cling can be washed away because the word of God overwhelms it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this beautiful passage of scripture, the way that, that Peter has so eloquently, obviously through the Holy Spirit, described both the, the, the sacrifice of Christ, the endurance of the word, uh, the permanency of your truth. And I pray that we can look at this and that we can absorb it ourselves and that we will make the word of God that, that reality that is flushing out that sin within us, flushing out those besetting sins that, that don't want to let go. And that the more that we flush, the more that we have that, that saturation of God's word, the more we will be able to come